Well, it's good to see all of you. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors at the Way Church. And over the last weeks, we've been going through, the last months, really, we've been going through something called the Sermon on the Mount, perhaps one of Jesus' most famous blocks of teaching. Even if you didn't grow up in the church, I guarantee you've heard some of these teachings before. And over the last five weeks, Jesus has taught on three staples of first century Jewish spirituality. Giving, prayer, which we spent four weeks talking about, and fasting. And today we're talking about fasting. And so let me invite you into the words of Jesus. This is from the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6. He says this, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces, leaving them unwashed and sprinkled with ashes. Not like cutting off noses or anything like that, but they kind of make it known they're fasting. To show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face like you're going to a party, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And so Jesus is speaking about fasting in the context of religious hypocrisy. And you've already heard this, but the Greek word hypocrite, it's taken from the Greek theater. The same actor would play different roles, and in order to do so, he or she would wear different masks. And so a hypocrite came to be known as someone who was two-faced, someone who lived and acted in different ways depending on the audience or the role they wanted to play. A person who held certain beliefs, but then denied those beliefs through their behavior. And Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites, the play actors, those who pretend to do stuff for God, but are really just doing religious deeds to be noticed by others. And you know you're fasting to please others if you get really frustrated when people don't notice how spiritual and committed you are, or when you always have to drop hints that you're fasting. You schedule meetings during mealtimes only to tell the person, Sorry, I can't eat. I'm fasting. <laughs> Don't, that's poor form. Don't do that. The ancient version was like putting ash on your face. It was a way of showing that you were fasting. And fasting is meant to make the statement, God, you're a priority above food. But if you're fasting for the approval of others, your heart isn't feasting on the Lord. It's running after the approval of people. And as we will see, Fasting can reveal the things that control us. But if we fast to obtain the approval of people, our fasting keeps us locked in the fetters of people's fickle praise. And Jesus says, don't fast like the hypocrites to receive approval. You will have your reward in full. So it's almost like Jesus is saying, one of the dangers of hypocrisy is how successful it can be. You fast to receive approval, and you get your reward, and it's tangible, and it feels great. But Jesus is driving at our heart motivation for fasting. He says prayer and fasting, they're practices that connect us to our Father in secret, in private. And our Father, who sees what is done in private, will reward us. So that's what Jesus is saying. And let me give you a map for the rest of this message. This is what I want to do together. First, I want to define fasting and give four qualifiers. Second, I want to look at examples of fasting in the Old and New Testament and give some commentary. Third, I want to talk about two potential benefits of fasting. And fourth, I want to end with a challenge. So there's the map. I'll remind you of it as we go through it. So first, when Jesus says, when you fast, what does he mean by fasting? Well, in the Bible, fasting is going without food for the purpose of intentional times of prayer and seeking God. 
It's often done in response to difficult situations or sacred moments or out of an increased desire for God's presence and direction. That's what fasting is biblically. Here are four qualifiers. First, in Scripture, biblical fasting is not a means to lose weight, manage calories, detox our body, or sculpt our abs. That's not the goal of biblical fasting. Like, that type of fasting is about us. Sometimes, if the heart motivation is wrong, it's about us showing forth our own glory. It's not necessarily wrong, but that type of fasting is about us. The showing forth your own glory, that could be problematic on a heart level. But you get what I'm saying. It's not necessarily wrong to fast for health purposes, but that type of fasting is about us, and biblically, fasting is God-orientated. Second, abstaining from something for a season isn't biblical fasting. Fasting from Netflix or social media or caffeine might be helpful, but it's not fasting in the biblical sense of the word. Third, if you're in the middle of a battle with an eating disorder, I want to say to you that you are seen And I want to encourage you to continue seeking help. I was praying for you this week, and I'm not asking you to fast. For some of us, our relationship with food and our body image is a real battle. Fasting is not the solution to that struggle. I'm not asking you to fast. If you've come out of a season of struggling with food, and that's back, you know, it's far, far, far in your rear view, Only consider fasting with accountability and people who know your story. It might be more helpful if you abstain from like caffeine during Lent than to engage in a full out fast. If you have any medical condition that would make it unsafe to fast, don't fast. If you're unsure, ask a doctor. And so I'm gonna make a strong case for biblical fasting. But if you've struggled with food, I want you to know you're seen and you matter so much to God and to us. And you're fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. And again, I was praying for you this week. Fourth, and last qualification. Fasting is not about earning God's favor. Like fasting is not a way to manipulate God to get God to do what we want. Like fasting doesn't guarantee the outcome we're desiring. We need to understand fasting in like a gospel framework, that fasting, like all the other spiritual disciplines or practices, is done in response to a God who has loved us first in Jesus. That we don't live and work for God's love, we live and work from God's love. We don't work for our salvation, we work out our salvation in obedience to God's grace and love in Jesus. Fasting isn't about striving to earn God's favor. It's one response to the favor God has already given us in Jesus Christ. Okay, those were the four qualifiers of what fasting is and isn't. Now we're going to look at examples of fasting in the Old and New Testament and offer some commentary. So we're moving along nicely. There's usually one word that stands out to every Western commentator on this passage that we're looking at. And it's the word when. It's used twice. Jesus says, when you fast. But when you fast. What word does Jesus not use? He doesn't use the word if. When Jesus says when, he's assuming his disciples will will fast. Because all throughout scripture, God's people fast. Fasting is mentioned more than 50 times in the Bible. Here are some examples. The people of God fasted every year on the Day of Atonement. It was a public fast. Jesus isn't against public fasting. He's speaking to our heart motivation. Every year, Israel would fast together on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And it was a time of national repentance and renewal, which involved confession, fasting, and prayer and sacrifice. Israel fasted during wars. Uh, Israel fasted while in battle against the Benjamites, Judges chapter 20. 
They fasted when loved ones were sick. King David prayed and fasted when his baby boy was ill. 2 Samuel chapter 12. God's people fasted when they were asking God for forgiveness. Moses fasted 40 days because of the sin of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 9. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah in chapter 58 of his book connects fasting to justice and mercy. That fasting isn't just about personal piety, it's about public acts of mercy and justice. So the prophet writes these words. Is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Bless you. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? And I think maybe this is the logic that Isaiah is highlighting. A true fast, God's chosen fast, is a fast that truly hungers for God. And a fast that truly hungers for God is a fast that truly hungers for holiness. And a fast that truly hungers for holiness is a fast that will starve sin and hate injustice. Therefore, a fast that truly hungers for God will hunger for justice and mercy and righteousness to flow. Otherwise, it's not a real, genuine fast. I think that's Isaiah's point. Let's look at the New Testament. Uh, in the New Testament, Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. As it says in Matthew 4, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I love that statement. It's kind of like, yeah, I bet. I bet he was hungry. Jesus fasted before starting his public ministry. The Apostle Paul fasted for spiritual direction and guidance, and so did the church. In Acts 13, it says this, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, Paul, for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. That this moment literally changed the course of world history. Like this moment of prayer and fasting changed world history. It launched a mission movement that turned Christianity from a fledgling kind of small movement within the Roman Empire to the major religion of the empire. And from this missionary journey emerged 13 letters that got into your New Testament. That this time of prayer and fasting literally changed the world as the Holy Spirit said, set apart Barnabas and Saul, Paul, for the work of I have called them to. And to be a part of our church at The Way is to be a part of a church that will start sites and plant independent churches. To be a part of our church is to be a part of a church that will raise up leaders and send them away for the sake of the church and for the sake of God's mission in the world. We're not trying to just build this church, we're trying to build and bless the church. And we will be praying and fasting and worshiping and the Holy Spirit will speak and God will give direction and God will set apart people for the work of planting and multiplication. And I'm not just saying that God will set apart pastors and staff. God will set apart people. As we pray and fast in the years to come, God will speak and set apart some of you. When we pray and when we fast, not if. Not if, but when. Then lastly, like the Old Testament, fasting was also connected to mercy and compassion and justice and generosity in the New Testament era. In the early Christian document known as the Shepherd of Hermas, a very important ancient Christian document dated from the first half of the second century, well-read, well-known, the author instructs Christians, so this is maybe the second, third generation of Christians, in this way. After refraining from bread and water, the Christian is to, quote, estimate the cost of the food you would have eaten on that day and give that amount to a widow or orphan or someone in need. Did you catch that? The early church fasted meals so they could have more to give to those who were in need. 
Sometimes I don't need to give more, I just need to spend less, and what I would have spent on myself, I give that away. This isn't biblical fasting, but I know a guy who like abstained from buying coffee and used the money he would have spent supporting the international justice mission. That kind of idea. I heard of another woman who, during Lent, ate only what the world's poor eat, grains. The entirety of Lent, she was focused on one aspect of poverty and cultivating a heart that longs for empowerment and forgiveness of debt and justice and equal opportunity. When you fast, not if. All throughout Scripture, God's people fast. Why? Well, think back over the examples I've cited. Fasting is often a response to a great need, a crisis, a loss, an injustice, an increasing desire to see God move in power or to experience like a deeper sense of God's presence or direction. It's an act of worship and repentance. It's a response. All throughout Scripture, when you fast, not if. Okay, we've defined fasting offered four qualifications, and looked at examples of fasting in the Old and New Testament. So for all you online and in the room, we're now on to movement three. And I want to talk about a few things fasting does in our walk with Jesus. We're going to look at this quote by Richard Foster. Maybe, maybe we're not. And, oh, no. More than any other discipline, more than any other discipline, fasting reveals the things that control us. It's very interesting. Sometimes I notice when I'm fasting that how often I turn to snacks to relieve boredom. There's something there that I don't want to look too deeply into. But, um... (laughs) More than, any other, <laughs> more than any other discipline, this is not in my notes, uh, fasting reveals the things that control us. This is a wonderful benefit to the true disciple who longs to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. We cover up what is inside of us with food and other things, but in fasting, these things surface. If pride controls us, it will be revealed almost immediately. David said, I humbled my soul with fasting. I love that verse. Anger, bitterness, jealousy, strife, fear, if they're within us, they will surface during fasting. We can rejoice in this knowledge because we know that healing is available through the power of Christ. So fasting can reveal what controls us. Fasting is like handing God a shovel that digs up the darkness that's underneath the surface of our lives. That a lot of like character defects and issues are hidden underneath comfort and food and other luxuries. You remove that, even for a short amount of time, issues come more readily to the surface. And the temptation is to think that fasting is creating the issues. I'm angry because I'm fasting. I'm impatient because I'm fasting. The hard, humbling truth is that fasting is revealing issues that are already there. A couple months into dating my wife, years ago, I almost broke up with her because I thought to myself, this woman is making me worse. And that doesn't sound very romantic. Is that the first time we dated or the second time? This is the second time. But here's what I realized. The truth is her life or her presence in my life was just revealing the selfishness and insecurity and pride that was already inside of me. Like her presence was exposing some of my insecurities and fears that had a controlling power in my life. Breaking up with her would have kept my character defects hidden without ever being healed, at least until the next relationship. I felt the same thing when I had kids, especially moving from one to two. Right? These children are making me worse. I thought I was so holy and sanctified, maybe ready for sainthood, just without the miracles. And so I'm like, and then we had two kids, and I'm like, I thought I was patient. Turns out I was just well rested, okay? So like, it's, if life squeezes you, 
What comes out of you is what's already inside of you. We're like sponges, and fasting will squeeze us, and what is inside will come out. And we say, that sounds terrible. I don't want to dig up the bad things. And fair enough. But what does Foster say? This is a wonderful benefit to the disciple who longs to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. It exposes the darkness of our hearts to the transforming love of a father who can deal with it and heal it. And in this way, fasting can lead to repentance. Repentance can lead to personal renewal. And personal renewal gone viral is revival, which doesn't happen apart from prayer and fasting. Fasting reveals the things that control us. It exposes the depths of our hearts to the love of the Father and the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. It's beautiful. Here's another one. Fasting also helps us practice self-denial for the purpose of obedience to Christ. That fasting reinforces the discipline of self-denial, of forsaking lesser things to experience the greater things of God. Jesus said these radical words about following him. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. In other words, march your independent will to the death in submission to his kingdom reign. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Jesus says, hey, if you want to follow me, deny yourself, not despise yourself. But deny yourself. And the purpose of the denial is to find life that is truly life through a relationship with Jesus. It's like deny your false self that's pursuing all these false gods that aren't going to satisfy your soul. And embrace your true self created to be like Christ in holiness and righteousness. Find life that is truly life through him. The denial is not an end in itself. That would be depressing. Instead, the denial is a means to a better, greater, deeper, richer end found through relationship with Jesus. And fasting is a miniature version of this self-denial. It's saying no to a good thing, food, to pursue a deeper relationship with Jesus. Fasting isn't saying that food is bad. It's saying that knowing Jesus is so much better. Fasting is putting an exclamation point on my desire for more of God. It's an expression of an intense desire for more of God. As one author writes, fasting is a periodic declaration that we would rather feast at God's table in the kingdom of heaven than feed on the finest delicacies of this world. Better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere, says the psalmist. You want a piety or a relationship with God like the psalmist? You need to embrace the practices of the psalmist. And they prayed and they fasted. And they feasted on the presence of God. Fasting reinforces the discipline of self-denial, the practice of forsaking lesser things to experience the greater things of God. And listen, I, like, we'll never have victory over the sin that ruins us until we train ourselves to do this, to forsake lesser things, to experience the greater things of God. And fasting helps. Fasting is this practice of self-denial for the purpose of obedience to Christ. And what I'm going to say next is going to feel a little intense. And this also isn't in my notes. But I want to say things to you that will produce Christians that can survive in any and every part of the world. Not just the comfortable West. And if we can't give up a meal to pursue a deeper relationship with God, what will happen when he says, give up that ungodly relationship? Or give up that habit? Or give up that standard of living? Or give up a lesser dream that doesn't reflect his will? Or move continents? Or give up your life? We're like, well, Jesus wouldn't do that. I'm like, what? That's like all he ever did. He just assumes he's worth it. 
If we can't give up a meal for him, how will we change the world with him? So again, fasting helps us practice self-denial for the purpose of obedience to Christ. Fasting is not saying food is bad. It's saying knowing Jesus is so much better. It reinforces the discipline of self-denial, of forsaking lesser things to experience the greater things of God. Okay, we've defined fasting with four qualifications. We've looked at examples in the Old and New Testament. We've explored two benefits of fasting. Lastly, here's the challenge. And I know you might be thinking that last thing wasn't the challenge, but <laughs> it's, <laughs> uh, it's the challenge implicit in Jesus' use of the word when. The challenge is to fast. Right? In times of need, in times of crisis, in times of revival, God's people fasted. It's true everywhere in Scripture, and it's been true throughout the entire course of church history. If you're able, and I said earlier, I don't think all of us are in this moment, but if you're able, fast. But walk before you run. Like, don't go on a seven-day fast. You're, like, super inspired or convicted. You're like, I'm going to fast for 21 days, starting tomorrow. That's not, you know, when we always try to be a hero, we end up feeling like a zero more than is healthy, okay? So, <laughs> write that down. Um, <laughs> so don't start with a three-day fast. <laughs> like, take baby steps. Miss a meal this week for the purpose of prayer. Then move up to a 24-hour fast, evening to evening. Drink juice. And don't do it alone. Fast with a friend or in community for mutual support, encouragement, and accountability. And start with a specific reason for a fast. This was so helpful for me. It's so practical. This is actually what separates fasting from other spiritual disciplines. Like, we read our Bible and pray regardless of what is going on in our lives. But fasting is often situational and done in response to a circumstance, event, or specific need. So listen to this quote because it expresses, I think, why some of us have struggled with fasting. I'll read it to you. In every instance, that's an overstatement. In most instances, it's always a great start when you're quoting someone to correct the first thing that you're reading. Uh, it's a bit of hyperbole. Uh, in most instances, fasting was a response to an extenuating circumstance. It wasn't spontaneous. It wasn't a spiritual discipline in the traditional sense like Bible intake or prayer. Meaning, you don't wake up on Friday or Monday and think, I should probably fast today. One reason, this is the author's experience, one reason I struggled with fasting was my random, impromptu, and aimless timing. Biblically, it seems that fasting is situationally birthed, circumstances prompted. So what's a pressing concern in your life? In your personal life, where are you longing for Jesus to show up? Like relationship difficulties, family problems, direction about what to do after school, work tension, you need a job. Like maybe we're struggling with a continual temptation or sin, and we've been in prayer. Why not add fasting to the mix? Other Christians around the world get this. And I don't always like these comparisons because I think, well, everywhere is different and I don't live there and that circumstance is different. But sometimes comparison for the sake of clarity and conviction is helpful. I was actually thinking about what is now South Korea and how in the 19th century, the first Protestant church was planted there. A hundred years later, there's 30,000 churches. That means 300 churches were planted every year for a hundred years. And it was all connected to prayer and fasting. There's a group of Christians from South Korea where 20,000 of them have completed a 40-day fast. I don't know what to say about that. That's, take, they take it seriously. Maybe you've heard the story of Brother Yoon. Uh, he's a movement leader in the Chinese church. 
and his family grew up without Bibles. And when he was young, his father had cancer, and the whole family was desperate, and in desperation, they decided, let's pray to Jesus. And his father was healed, and the whole family came to Christ, uh, but Yoon didn't have a Bible, and he desperately wanted one. And all his mom could tell him was that Jesus was the Son of God, he died for our sins, and his words are recorded in the Bible. That's all she could tell him. And he wanted to know more. And his mom remembered that in a neighboring town, there was a man, an older man, who before the Cultural Revolution was a pastor. And so they walked to his house and asked him if he had a Bible. And there was immediate fear in his eyes. And he said to them, the Bible is a heavenly book. If you want one, you'll need to pray to God, to the God of heaven. Only he can provide you with a heavenly book. And so Yoon believed the pastor's words, and so he started to pray and pray, Lord, give me a Bible, amen. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. So he went back to the pastor's house and said, hey, man, I prayed and nothing happened. It's my paraphrase of what he said. And the pastor saw how desperately he wanted a Bible and said to him, if you're serious, then you should kneel down and pray to the Lord, you should also fast an exclamation point on your desire. And so he went home and every morning and afternoon he didn't eat anything, he just had rice in the evening. And he prayed and prayed and fasted for a Bible. And then one morning he had a dream. And in the dream, there was a kind old man pulling a large cart of fresh bread. And two other men were walking beside the cart. And when the old man saw him, he slowed down and showed great pity and concern and said, Are you hungry? Yes, I have nothing to eat, Yoon replied. In the dream, the old man took a bag of bread and gave it to him, saying, You must eat this immediately. And as soon as Yoon put it in the bread in his mouth, it, it turned into a Bible. And so he started praising God in the dream. And then he woke up and he started searching the house, looking for this Bible. He thought, the Lord has done it. And when he didn't find it, he realized it had only been a dream. He started crying loudly. His parents woke up. They thought he's going crazy. And his father grabbed him and with tears in his eyes prayed, Dear Lord, have mercy on my son. Please give him a Bible. There was a knock at the door. And a voice gently called his name. And he rushed over and whispered through the door, Are you bringing the bread to me? The gentle voice replied, Yes, we have a bread feast to give you. And he recognized the voice from the dream. And he opened the door, and there were the two servants he saw in the dream. And they had a red bag, and in that bag was the Bible. He later found out the name of the two men, Brother Wang and Brother Sung. They came from a village a ways away because of a detailed dream to give the Bible to him. He prayed and fasted until he got his Bible and then he devoured the pages. And this story is so far removed from our context, not because of the visions or dream or miracles, God's doing that all over. It's so far removed from our context because of the hunger and desperation this one man had for the word of God which led him to prayer and fasting. We don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. To live by bread alone is to starve spiritually. And when we hear a story like this, we realize that we're well-fed in the West, but we are spiritually impoverished, and we want that to change. So it's like, God, please give us a hunger for God, for you. Last Sunday night, we worshiped Sunday night Pentecost worship service. We worshiped, and as a church, you could feel a hunger for God in the room. Like, we felt it. And I also felt, we felt, like it was only the beginning. It was only the beginning of God birthing in us as a church, a newer church, a hunger for his presence, a hunger for his kingdom, a hunger for justice, mercy, righteousness to flow like never-ending streams. And fasting is just one of the means by which we express a desire for more of God, knowing that the end is more of, of Jesus and holiness. 
fasting is just the means, Jesus is the end, and Jesus is worth it. When we fast, not if, our Father will see what is done in secret, and He will reward us. That's His promise, not mine. And so I said fasting is a response. It's not an attempt to earn God's favor, or twist God's arm. You don't ever have to twist God's arm because God loves you and his arms are open wide to all of us in Jesus. But fasting is a response to the grace and goodness of God in Jesus. And so is this table. This table's a reminder that Jesus, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. And the tempter came to him and tried to get him to avoid the cross. But in fasting and in prayer, Jesus quoted the word of God. And where Adam failed and where we fail, Jesus succeeded in obeying his father. And that obedience took him straight to the cross where he died for our sins in our place so that we could be reconciled to God. We don't earn it. It's just a gift. And so come receive this gift. And as you receive it, as you take communion, my prayer is that God breaks off any sense of striving that a message on fasting might wrongly create in our hearts. I just want the Lord to break that off. Fasting is, like all the disciplines, just another invitation from our loving Father to us.